I guess we'll get started. Um, I'm trying to figure out the best place to stand where I can like point to things without messing it up. Okay. Um, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Chris Micklejohn. Um, I'm an engineer at uh, Bachelor of Technologies. Obviously, I work on React. Um, I work on the multi data center replication uh, right now, uh, but I move around a bit and I do a bunch of work on CRDTs and things like that. So I'm primarily based in the States, uh, and I was in Europe traveling for a conference uh, related to some of the stuff that we're going to talk about uh, in this talk today. So, um, so this talk is primarily about the strong consistency functionality and the CRDT functionality, which are kind of two of the, in addition to Yokozuna, are two of the kind of like flagship features of React 2.0, um, which is in beta release right now, uh, beta 1. Um, so you can play with all the things that we're going to talk about in this, in this deck today. Um, and there are a couple of example repos that show you how to play around with this stuff, and I'm happy to talk more about it. Especially the CRDT stuff, which is very, which I'm very fond of. Cool. Um, all right. So uh, what we'll do is we'll do a brief overview of React um, in case you don't know how uh, many of the mechanisms inside React work. Uh, if you do, this will be a very brief review. So uh, getting started. So again, you've probably heard this a hundred times. Uh, so React is an Erlang implementation of Dynamo. Um, this is not Dynamo DB. This is the original Dynamo, which was outlined in an academic paper that Amazon published in uh, SOSP in 2007. Um, and for some reason, the slide is duplicated. Um, and, and what that paper basically talked about was how to build a database system where uh, you basically sacrifice consistency, strong consistency or linearizability, for a system uh, that has higher availability. So when you don't need to coordinate operations across a large number of nodes, uh, you can basically guarantee higher availability, but you have to relax some of these consistency guarantees. Uh, so the core of how React stores data in the back end is this thing called a React object. So if you look in the Erlang code, you'll see our object or React object commonly referred to. There's a few different formats that we've gone through. Um, and, and what it kind of is, is it stores a key, which is a bucket in key, uh, which is kind of the key, but uh, the bucket is just a namespace applied to the key, and then it has this value. Um, and what this value is going to be is completely opaque to the system, except in certain cases of CRDTs, uh, which we won't talk about because it's a little too detailed. But um, this value is going to be opaque. It can be binary. We have customers who store audio data. We have uh, customers who use semi-structured data, such as JSON or XML. Um, it can be whatever you want. And when you go to write these objects, you specify a content type. And uh, you know, in the case of a binary uh, binary data, you would use like kind of MIME standard content types. So you'd say like application octet stream, or uh, in the case of JSON, you'd say application JSON or application XML, things like this. So, a brief review of the consistent hashing mechanism. So, how do we distribute data across uh, uh, of these nodes? So you have a React cluster. The cluster is going to be made up of uh, four to five nodes, and we need a mechanism to deterministically, deterministically route data to nodes that minimizes data moving around the cluster to give you better performance. Uh, so what we do is we take this integer space, it's 2 to the 160th, um, so you, you imagine we start mapping at this, uh, the top of the ring, the zero location, and we map all around at 2 to the 160th. Uh, and then what we do is we have some number that's a power of 2 that we subdivide that integer space into, and each of these is called a partition. Um, and then what we do is we have a series of nodes, and we distribute these partitions as evenly as possible across all those nodes. So if you've seen that uh, we commonly recommend five nodes instead of three, we used to recommend three nodes. Uh, we commonly recommend five nodes as the smallest React cluster size. The reason for that is because with five, with a power of two ring size, um, it's the only, a power of two partition size, it's the only way we can guarantee that neighboring replicas, you see they have these three colors, the neighboring uh, partitions are not on the same physical node. So it's a property of the algorithm that's used to distribute those partitions out, which is like kind of a two-phase commit gossip gossip-based protocol. So dynamic membership, uh, which we'll talk about here, but I'll leave the graph up to demonstrate. So dynamic membership is the ability to take one of these nodes, so let's say the blue node, and remove it from the cluster while the system's running, and redistribute that data across the ring. Um, similarly, you can add nodes and redistribute it again. And we want to keep the system available while we make all of those changes. Um, and finally, with the replication factor, um, we have a series of replicas and we want to place those on positions of the ring so that replicas of the same data item are stored on different nodes 
and we can reason about where those replicas are located by saying this pink one here, we're just going to walk the ring clockwise to find where the next two locations of those replicas are. So this gives us a deterministic way to say, given any piece of data, we can find its location on the ring, find the neighboring replicas, and then return those back. So that's kind of the React overview, probably very familiar if you've ever worked with the system. So, we're going to kind of talk about, what, so we're making these trade-offs between strong consistency and eventual consistency, and it, it, you know, we have these two definitions that we'll use to kind of frame the problem here. So, we have high availability, and high availability has commonly been defined by Gilbert Lynch as that not every non-failing node in the cluster can potentially respond to a response. Um, Similarly, if we look at eventual consistency, eventual consistency is from Wikipedia, but uh, Warner Vogels has said something very similar to this. I think it's a paraphrase from what he originally said, uh, is that eventual consistency is a model used in distributed computing that informally guarantees that if no updates are made to the system, eventually all accesses to that data item will return the most updated value. So the way that you think about this, you know, in like in layman's terms, is that you know if I go to write a data item and I write data item X and then I, you know, I write it at value one, and then I write it at value two, I may see value one for a while, and value two might take a little bit of time to appear. That's essentially eventual consistency. That's a Linus property say, well, eventually we'll see the right value, but we're never gonna return a wrong value, which is kind of a safety property. So that, those are the kind of two trade-offs that we make. Uh, eventual consistency enables high availability. If we say that items can be stale for a while, that means we don't have to have everybody agree on something at the exact same moment in time, and by making that trade-off, we get higher availability because everybody can respond to a request. <clears throat> so, the two things, so the two main modes that React operates in uh, that are kind of core to this strong consistency, eventual consistency, and CRDTs are last writer wins and allow mult. So we're going to talk about what these mean. So I'm going to use this tuple structure, which should be familiar for all of you Erlang programmers. Uh, I usually have to explain this a little bit more in depth if I was in an Erlang uh, group, so this is super nice. Um, so we're going to say we have a writer, uh, we're going to have a value, and then we're going to have some time. And we're just going to use like some symbols to deal with uh, what this means. So uh, in the case of concurrent writers that are writing, they each have to write to this, the same replica set. So they have to write to this replica of three nodes if you're using the default React configuration. So we're going to say we have two writes. So we have a write uh, that's done by A. So if you remember, we have writer value time. So we have A is the writer, value is V1, which means that this is the first value I'm writing to the database. And I'm not saying what that value is. I'm just saying it's, it's value one written by A. And then I say that write occurs at time two, time T1. So uh, this should be T1. Ah, uh, well, ignore that. Um, so pretend that's T1. So what happens is we have concurrent writes, and they basically race for writing. So you can end up with a situation where you have A, B and A on the series of replicas, and you have, uh, they are all value one, it's A's first write, and it's B's first write, and they all occurred at time one. So the two strategies we have, last writer wins, and allow them all to handle this differently. So when the last writer wins, these are the values, that remember this is supposed to be a T1, <laughs> uh, and last writer wins, these are the values that are written to the database, but these are the values that result in it. So after all the read repair is done, and you go to read the values from the database, you get B across across everything. Sorry, is, is T2 supposed to be greater than T1? Is that why it's T2 Yes, correct? that's correct. Mm -hmm. So maybe T2 is correct on the top? Uh, yes. yes, you are correct. T2 is greater than T1. Yes, I revised these slides like 30 minutes ago, so I, I, I screwed up. But yes, you're, I didn't screw up. I did it correctly. Um, right. So B is going to win because time 2 is greater. Even though they're writing the first value of the object, B wins because it's logical, it's physical clock. An actual timestamp, wall clock time, is greater, so that wins. However, in the allow mult strategy, where we take both values and we return them back to the user, and the user needs to reconcile these values, we end up storing both of them. So we end up with A, V1, and T1, and the B of V1 and T2. So we'll store both of these values and you retrieve them. So last writer wins is obviously bad because you're lo you lose updates. You have updates that get written, you can never read them, they immediately get overwritten or resolved through read repair. And allow mult is bad because programmers don't like having an API where you have to deal with getting multiple objects back. When you perform a write, it's kind of counterintuitive to say, oh hey, I had this concurrent write that added something, I had a concurrent write on this other node that added something, and then one of them wins and I lose the other updates. That's not good. But if I keep both of them, how do I know how to reconcile these values? And what we've seen, if you watch any of the talks at most of our conferences with customers who have implemented this, is that 
They end up writing merge functions. All of these users end up writing user-specified merge functions. They don't want to lose writes, so they have to run an allow vault. And then when they read values, they have to have mechanisms for reasoning about which update was right or how to merge that state. So examples of this are, you know, Yammer uh, has had to do things similar. Uh, Bump had to write a pro wrote a proxy service in Haskell that all their reads went through that knew how to deterministically resolve every possible divergence correctly. Um, in addition to that, uh, companies like Klarna do something similar where they model their data in a mechanism where every update commutes so they don't have to worry about this. Um, trying to think. There's a bunch of others. There's numerous other cases that we can talk about, but those are the three that I remember offhand. So, so what's the problem with user-specified merge functions? So user-specified merge functions are bad because they're not always correct. Um, programmers don't always write correct code all the time, in case you haven't realized this. Um, and writing user-specified merge functions that are going to resolve values and write them back to the database potentially result in data loss. Um, you know, and relying on programmer intuition to say, I'm going to write a data structure where I guarantee that every operation I can do this data structure commutes all the time is really hard. Examples of this, operational transforms. Google took, what, five years to get it right, and then Mark Shapiro and his group comes along and writes a paper and says, we've pr formally proven through inductive like proofs that it's wrong. It, it doesn't work. It's not correct. Um, this is a really, really hard thing to do. So what are we trying to do? So in the eventual side of things, we're trying to provide a mechanism that allows us to not have to write these merge functions. As a programmer, you want to work with an API that's straightforward, that is like a counter, it's like a set, it's like a map, but you want these convergence properties to say that all of the updates can happen in any order and I end up with the right state, because that's a nice programming model for a user to have. Um, you allow the values to be delayed, but you guarantee that no updates are missed and you eventually end up with the correct value. So that's where CRDT is coming to it. So this is the first part of the talk that talks about uh, using eventual consistency, but providing a better data model for working with your data so you don't have to worry about getting multiple values back and reasoning about how to merge those values. So, what are CRDTs? Um, so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, CRDT is coming two flavors. Uh, they come in this convergent flavor, so there's convergent replicated data types, which are CV RDTs, and then we have commutative replicated data types, which are CM RDTs. Uh, but they're all part of this general thing called conflict-free replicated data types. And, and what, these, what these data structures are, they're synchronization-free data structures. They're, they're data structures that model, the, that model some sort of primitive data structure in a way that it preserves state, and state always progresses, so we can reason about the ordering of events and ensure that the values merge correctly. So to get super mathy for a minute, what does that mean? Uh, CRDTs are monotonic, their state always moves in one direction, uh, presumably increasing is the useful direction for this state to move in, and they're confluent. Um, when you have things that are monotonic and confluent, they're convergent. So this is what we care about here, is that we want data structures that are convergent. And what does this mean in terms of the React data store? It means that we can run with allow mult, we can create a ton of siblings, and we know how to resolve these siblings. We have a mathematical foundation for saying, I know how to merge these things and get the right value. So I can have two sets that exist across data centers, I have replication between the data centers, I can have inserts and updates and deletes happening on both sides. As soon as those values merge, you get the correct value. So, what's the theory behind all this stuff? So, there's a bunch of papers, this is what I do for fun, um, because I'm also a grad student, <laughs> um, is papers like this. So, INRIA published its first paper, a comprehensive study. This has a large majority of the theory behind it. If you're interested, you should read it. Um, this is the optimized conflict-free replicated data set that allows us to do things without creating tombstones, uh, which allow us to not create garbage, which allows us to actually use this stuff in practice. So, this is a very important paper to our research. And finally, dotted version vectors um, expand from version vectors which come from vector clocks. So React used to use a primitive vector clock mechanism in earlier versions. Uh, we switched to version vectors, and well, the library provides a vector clock library, which is equivalent to a version vector semantically, uh, a set, um, but has some different operating uh, properties about how you work with it. Um, and finally, uh, in React 2.0, uh, we have dotted version vectors. Uh, and what dotted version vectors do is allow you to reason about another level of concurrency. Um, and we're not going to talk about what that particularly is, but if you've dealt with the sibling expression problem, this, prohibit, this prevents it. So, um, 
So uh, the math behind this, we'll do a quick little math rundown for those interested to kind of give you an example why this is interesting and why this works. So uh, bounded joint semi-lattices, this is a concept from uh, discrete mathematics. Um, this is basically a partially ordered set that has a least upper bound function. Um, this least upper bound function has three important properties, associativity, commutativity, and idempotence. We'll go through this quick because I know this is not very relevant to Erlang programming, but it's interesting about how this works. So uh, what is, what is, what's interesting about associativity? So associativity, if you remember from math, is that if I batch up things this way, I get the same result. So if you think of uh, this dot being a binary operator, an operator that operates on two values, um, you, you remember that addition is associative. You don't, it doesn't matter what order that you add values in, you get the correct value. Um, for positive, non-negative, for neg non-negative integers are natural numbers. Um, commutativity has this property where I can reorder the two operations at work, so addition adheres to this property as well. In distributed systems, we deal with events coming in different orders at different machines all the time. So this is a very nice property to have when you think about the analog to computing. Associativity is dealing with batch insensitivity. And finally, idempotence, we all like this in our programs, idempotence is the ability to have an operation, take a value, and then take that value again, and take it again, and take it again, and still get the same value. So idempotence is very important as well because sometimes messages get sent more than once for the same operation. So, these three things are really nice and have a very nice analog to distributed systems or concurrency or threads or whatever you have uh, that you do concurrency with. So if we combine these things together, um, we have these objects that accumulate state over time, and we have this bounded joint semi-lattice which computes a least upper bound function. Uh, this gives us this monotonicity and confluence property which gives us convergence. And what we get is the ability also to map these lattices into each other, so we can compose these lattices in all sorts of fancy ways as well. So we're going to walk through an example. So this is all math, and you apply, oh my god, this is really hard, or maybe you know it all. If you don't, then we'll do this <laughs> example that will make it super easy to understand it. So you just briefly define confluence, sorry. Yeah, confluence is values moving in the same direction. It's uh, values mer basically merging together. So you have a merging together of values, and then you have values that are always increasing or monotonically increasing in state, really and then you get this convergence property. Uh, so, uh, there's a bounded joint semi-lattice for a set. Um, the merge function for a set is union. So if I have a set with B, A, or C, and then I receive these results, so these represent merges with additional states. So if I have A and C and I merge them, I get A and C, because I union the sets. If I have A, C, and B, C, I get A, B, and C, right? So I can continuously merge these things. State always increases. Uh, and I get this property where the values continuously move up. If you imagine these things happening in any order, I end up with the right results. So you basically continuously move forward, accumulate state, and apply these merge functions. Is that straightforward? Everybody get that? It's pretty easy. You probably do this in programming all the time. Um, here's a, another one that's pretty easy. Increasing natural numbers, so positive, non, uh, positive integers, non-negative integers, have a merge function max that computes this least upper bound. So if I have three and five and I merge it, I get five. I'm never going to get a value less than five if, one, if I'm always merging with five or applying the operation with five. If I have five and seven, I get seven. If I have five and seven, I get seven, right? So max always moves in one direction. You never call the max function and get a value less than one of the callers. Again, we could do this opposite. We could say min is a function on decreasing numbers as well. Uh, Boolean is another one. The merge function for Booleans is or. So if I have false and false, and I or it, I get false. If I or it with a true, I get true. And then once I get true, I get true forever. Because anything or with true always gives you true. So. so we also can map these together. So we have a function that allows, that preserves this monotonicity property. Um, so this is, this is the definition of this kind of monotonicity. As the inputs increase, the outputs also increase. It's a monotone function. We can map these together. So we could say, so. So size on a set that can only ever grow, size is a monotone function because the size will never get smaller on a set that can never shrink. So I could have a function that computes the size at every one of these merge points and it can form another lattice like this. So we have this composition property that's very nice about it as well. So uh, we'll walk through an example of how this works and then we'll look at what you can do to use these data types in your application. So. Uh, 
we'll look at convergent replicated data types. We don't talk about the commutative data types because the commutative data types rely on all sorts of fancy distributed systems, things like causal delivery, which we don't have uh, in React or in Erlang specifically. You have you can make some guarantees in Erlang, but you can't make causal delivery guarantees on a on a series of processes. So we're going to look at the OR set. So the OR set is a set where you can insert an item, you can remove an item if you've observed its addition into it, and then uh, you can do this infinitely many times. So how does this look? So imagine this line separates two replicas. So these are two replicas. <coughs> Let's, we can pretend they're running on the same database node uh, in different partitions. We can pretend they're running on two different threads. We can pretend we're running on one is in North, North Virginia uh, EC2 and the other is in Oregon. So what we have is we have, so this is like Erlang syntax, just to look familiar. This is a set of two sets, or rather a list of two lists, and these are two tuple. Uh, the first item in the tuple represents uh, a unique identifier, and the second one represents the element we want to add to the set. So we say unique ID one, so this is a, this, just any unique identifier, we say one is added, uh, one marks the addition of A. So this set rep represents additions, this empty list here, this empty set represents removals. So that gets replicated across the network. So now I can have concurrent removals of that A. I could say replica A removes A, uh, oh, sorry, we'll, we'll use uh, other, other names for the replicas. We'll say replica X on this side and Y here. We say they both are concurrently removing it. So they both say I've observed A added at one in the at set and I now are observing A being removed at one in the remove set. So if I actually try to compute the, what's the value of this set right now? has no elements in it, because I've observed the addition of A and the removal of A. So that's replicated, or it can happen concurrently, still works fine, the merge is fine. So now, on replica X here, I add A back in, and I use a different unique identifier. So I say I've observed A added at 1, I've observed the removal of A at 1, and now I've observed the addition of A at 2. So now when I merge this, with this, I get the correct value. Um, even if these operations happen completely independently, and didn't and didn't merge until the very, very end when you wanted to get the value, I get the correct value. And the value here is that A is in the set. Because one replica added it, the other one added it, uh, sorry, one replica added it, replicated it, stayed over, they both removed it, and then one guy added it. So if I didn't model this by saying I keep track of every addition and removal, you have an interesting problem that you have to deal with, right? So if I say I don't model this as removals, and I just you know, go back here, and I say, well, to remove it, I just remove it from this set. Then later when I go to merge it, how do I know if I've observed the removal or I've never observed the addition or I've observed the addition on the removal? You don't know. You can't reason about if you've seen something and removed it or never observed it being there in the first place. So this is why it's important. This is why I said that monotonicity property is important because it'll, it accumulates state. You get to track the history of how the event's observed. So we actually don't model this in this way in the Erlang library because this creates a lot of garbage for values that have been removed. So we actually have a much smarter way to do it with DVDs. But the smarter way is not as easy to explain in two minutes in a talk in front of 25 people. So we'll do another quick example. A is added in both sets at time one or unique identifier one. Uh, we have concurrent operations happen where B is added at value two, A is removed at value one. And I get the correct value. When I merge those, I end up with the correct value, which is that B is in the set and A is no longer in the set. So merge is correct. OK, so what do we have that you can actually use? So that is not, wouldn't that be a funny joke? I was just like, there's no Erlang library. You can't use any of it, no. Um, there you go. So we have a library called React DT. It is an Erlang library. You can add it as a rebar dependency um, or whatever you use for your dependency tracking. Uh, that's the repo. It's fully open sourced. It's EQC. Uh, it's tested very heavily. Um, and it implements a bunch of these data structures. So what does React DT provide? So um, this, is, um, this is the interface that React DT provides. So it provides a bunch of CRDTs that you can build your applications with. Um, each of these has to implement a series of functions, so it has to implement, um, this is a behavior, the React DT behavior that they all implement. Uh, we have a new operation that creates a CRDT, um, so all of our CRDTs implement that. Um, we have the value function, which allows you to get what the actual value is, so you have this complicated set thing that's tracking all this history. Sometimes, you know, when you want to actually use it, you want to know what values are in the set, so you call value. Uh, this update, which takes a series of operations, those operations are dependent on what type of CRDT you're working with. 
Um, there's a merge function. This, this is that function that has to compute that least upper bound. It has to do that merge and get the correct value. Um, we have an equality function, which tests the equality between two CRDTs. And then we have a two binary and from binary, which are used as um, to provide the encoding mechanism that React actually used to send some of this data on the wire. So this whole binary encoding uses some, uses like the, uh, uh, whatever the compression is in the binary to term, term the binary binary to term compression uh, inside of React. Um, <coughs> so this is pretty easy to work with. So this library is used inside of React. Um, it uses a React 1.4 kind of use the, didn't use the library, but use some of the files that are in the library now um, to provide counters. So it had a counter that could go up and down. That's a PN counter. It was built with a G counter. So if you actually look in the library, you have the grow only counter, and then you have the positive negative counter, the one that tracks additions and removals. Um, these counters are uh, not idempotent. Um, there is a way to have an idempotent counter. We don't currently have an idempotent counter in there. Uh, it's really easy to make one because all you do is model a counter as a set, and then you have one that supports it. Um, the counters have time complexity, space complexity of O of, uh, sorry, space complexity of O of actors. So the number of actors, because we actually model a count per actor. So space complexity of O of actors. Is that servers in your case? <clears throat> no, that's, uh, no, sure. If you're using the library, it's whatever you send as the actor argument. In terms of React, it's going to be, um, it's going to be the, uh, the index partition, which is the uh, V node identifier. So the V node identifier is fixed to your end val, but then that V node could be running on a fallback, so it's bounded on your number of fallbacks. So it's kind of like the space complexity. The word, yeah, space complexity would be your end val times number of possible fallback servers, so, um, which is essentially the number of actors you have in the React system. So um, if we look at the interface for the G counter and the PN counter there, there, we implement that interface we just talked about. Uh, it exports some type signatures that you can use when you want to do your dialyzing. Um, and it's modeled as basically an ord dict. So we just kind of sugar up some values, but use the actual data structure that's used inside is an ord dict. And then it has these two operations, an increment, and then an increment by an integer. So you can say increment to increment it once, so you can say increment five to add five to the counter. PN counter, same thing. All we do is basically compose two G counters. So we have a two grow only counters, one that tracks the positives and one that tracks the negatives. We take the difference. Um, and so we have these two operations here. So we extend that to have a decrement, which the decrement base just calls an increment on the decreasing set. So pretty easy. You see, model by actor increment decrement. Um, that stuff is changing because that uses DBBs now too. So, what do we have on React 2.0? So, in React 2.0 we have a lot more than just counters because counters aren't that interesting. Um, it uh, requires bucket types. So, uh, bucket types in React are a way to set bucket properties. Um, so, like replication factors and things like that, um, but ensure that they are the same across all nodes in the cluster. So, it actually uses like a two-phase kind of commit academic protocol to ensure that uh, all the nodes agree on what a particular key's namespace should be stored as and um, make sure that all the nodes agree before it allows you to use it. So, uh, bucket types you'll probably hear more about. It's required for Yokozuna, it's required for... Yes, you had a question? Uh, the plum tree? Pretty sure? We can talk more about that after. There's a there's an actual video on the whole talk about how it's implemented. But I'm pretty sure that's the one that's used. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's a paper on it as well. Uh, Jordan West gave the talk he implemented it all. So uh, React 2.0 has a cluster metadata mechanism which allows us to store metadata and ensure that it's replicated across the cluster. That supports some KD functionality and it uses this uh, this gossip protocol that we this ep epidemic broadcast protocol. <clears throat> Uh, it's supported by both of our APIs, so there's an HTTP API and there's a protocol buffers API as well. Um, so what are the caveats? Um, MapReduce and 2i don't work on these apps. So 2i doesn't work on the CRDTs. Um, MapReduce doesn't as well. The JavaScript MapReduce definitely doesn't. In Erlang, you can do it because you can just call the functions to get the values, but through the normal JavaScript like HTTP API, you can't unless you have a custom function that you upload, and the function can't be JavaScript unless you write 
a parser, uh, or our binary format that we use for the CRDTs, which you can do, but if you're going to go to that effort, you should just do it in Erlang. Uh, which I shouldn't have to say because you're all Erlang programmers and you would want to do it in Erlang. <clears throat> so what do we have? Um, so we have sets. Uh, these sets of support additions and removals. So this is the observed remove set without tombstone. So it's the same thing I just showed you in a much more efficient manner where it doesn't create garbage because distributed garbage collection is hard. Um, these sets are idempotent. So you can, obviously, a set is idempotent. Um, you only can ever add an element to it once. And that's all I have to say about sets. Um, the sets have a bias. So for a lot of these operations to work, when concurrent operations with the same actor occur to the data structure, uh, we need to apply a bias to deterministically kind of merge this uh, without there being uncertainty. So some biases are done in time, based on time in some other implementations of CRDTs. Uh, ours just has an add when bias. So if you have an addition, a concurrent addition and removal of a set, uh, the add, or an item in the set, the add will win. Um, concurrent removals with the same actor. So. <clears throat> um, space complexity, O of actors plus elements. So it stores basically a vector of the elements that are in it and then stores a vector of dots from the dotted version vector to track what updates we've seen from what actors in the system. So it's modeled differently than the one that you saw before. Uh, here's the uh, API for the G set. Uh, so this is the grow only set that you only can add to. It only has one operation, add exports the same API, so you can use this API in your application. Uh, this is the OR set, so this is the add remove that creates garbage, so you have this API that allows you to add and remove from a set. Um, your adds, you send an actor, the removals find the last observed addition and use that as the removal actor. And finally, this is the OR swap, the observed remove set without tombstones. The OR swap has the same API that has better space complexity, obviously. So, um, what's the real exciting thing that we have? Uh, our maps. So, a map would be like a dictionary uh, where you could store something like a JSON object. Uh, maps are very exciting. Um, this is something that nobody else has who's doing CRDTs. Uh, we actually just wrote a paper about it. Uh, that's why we're here in Europe. Uh, so, this is really fantastic. Uh, these maps are recursive, so it allows composition of CRDTs. So, I can have a map. And then inside of that map, I can have a set, which is a OR set without tombstones, um, or I can have a counter, and it will recursively update all of the values and ensure that it merges correctly. Um, it essentially, yeah, it's nestable to an associative array, if that is a better description of how you think about maps or dictionaries. Um, maps have an update, uh, have an update wins addition bias. So, um, in the event, so this is, uh, yeah, this is interesting because we have an add remove API that we want to get rid of. Um, the add one specifically, you used to have to say add this item, add this as like a counter. So I'd have a map and you'd say add key x and the value is going to be a counter. Uh, and then you would update it. Uh, we have an API that just allows you to say update it immediately and it will add the element if it's not there. Um, so we're the, originally the update operation would win. Uh, over the add or remove, um, but now it's we're kind of narrowing that down to just the update API. So the update will win, and it has the set semantics so that an up an add on an update wins. Um, and there's some interesting things here because a map can see. So there's some interesting things you have to think about. So the map encodes a type because what happens if I say uh, me and somebody else, or me and Brian, we concurrently operate on this map. I say add the score as a counter, and he says add the score as a set. But what happens now? So there is a way to resolve that. Um, you can build a lattice of lattices that allow us to say, well, I can take a counter and I can map that into a set, or I can take a set and map that back into a counter. That's really complicated. People don't want to think about that. Uh, so we encode the type in there. So you say, when I want to get the score, you say it's a counter. Um, and you say it's a counter when you work with it, and it just works. So again, this is modeled using a set as the underlying data structure. So it has exactly the same space complexity, actors by elements. So this is what the API looks like. Um, it allows you to specify uh, uh, update. You get to spay this map field update, which I believe I left out, yeah, or this map field operation, which allows you to compose all of these data types. So we say you can add keys. The keys are just normal names, or atoms, or strings, if you're using one of the APIs that prefers, you know, HTTP would be strings. <coughs> and you could say make the values a counter, make it a register. A register is uh, one that never changes. We'll talk about that next. 
Boolean, another set, another map. You can recursively nest these things as deep as you want. Can I take that to mean that it's storing both of the values in perpetuity, and you just choose which one you want? If there's two types, you choose the type that you want it. It will yeah. store both of them. Yeah. It will store both of them. That's correct. Right. Yeah, because it basically uses that. It, it kind of hashes those values and uses it as the key. So it does store both of them. Yeah. So, um, so the maps support composition of the register, the Boolean, the set, or the map. So we talked about the map already. We talked about the set already. The Boolean is just kind of going to be a value that is true and the merge is an or. So it will merge to true. You know, we'll start at false and merge up to true. Or you have one that starts at true and moves to false. Um, which just applies a not operation to the semantics of the one that goes from false to true. Um, and finally, the register. So the register, the LWW register, is a CRDT that is a last writer wins register. So this is, remember at the beginning we said last writer wins is a semantic in the database that says by logical, like by wall clock time, take the last value observed. This is a register that's going to say, by wall clock time, takes the last of values. Or, so it will store a bunch of values, and the merge function will just automatically pick the last one. Um, so this is a very special form of a lattice. So there are some very interesting lattice forms. One is this last right wins, where it says the merge function is deterministic based on this time that's passed in. The other one is a one that can never progress. So it says, once I get the value that's immediately the top value, I ignore all the values, which is an immutable one. We don't provide that mechanism, but it's a very useful lattice property. It's a lattice that reaches its top value immediately and never proceeds. So the last writer wins register has the same API. Um, you say assign, and then you specify what you want to assign it, and that can be any binary data. It will store whatever the last one is. Um, booleans, um, so booleans, they can be enabled or disabled. They move in the opposite direction, and this is time complexity of O of factors, so it's just modeled as a set. Uh, all the people who do updates. And this is what your API looks like for this. Same API. So everything has the same API. It uses the behavior. If you want to use this in your early programs, you can. Uh, a, a couple examples. I have a project that provides an alternative to GProc. If you're familiar with GProc, it's a global process registry. It has problems where it doesn't have high availability. Um, I have a version that's built on CRDT. So that's an example of another application that's not React using this, because we provide it as a general Erlang library. Um, another one is, uh, if you know Heinz Geis, who's uh, another Erlang factory regular, uh, in addition to me, um, he has a project called uh, Project FIFO, which provides configuration management uh, for, um, uh, why am I forgetting the name, SmartOS, SmartOS instances. Um, he uses CRDTs as well for use storing state, ensuring that concurrent updates to things always end up with great value. And there's a bunch of other cases. Uh, of people using CRDTs, um, and specific, specifically our Erlang library. So, uh, finally, uh, this a lot of this research that we've been doing here is partially funded by uh, the Same Free Consortium, which is a uh, European Union-funded research project in the Seventh Framework Program. Um, me, Russell Brown, and Sean Cripps are primarily have been the contributors uh, on the bachelor side of things, but this is a partnership with Rovio and Trifork. Uh, as the industry partners and the academic project uh, uh, partners being a couple of universities in Portugal, uh, INRI in Paris, uh, Kaiserslautern in Germany, and Koch University. So, perfect. So, that's how we can provide higher availability through eventual consistency. Um, there are alternatives though. Sometimes you need to read the values you write immediately. So this is the, this is the second half of the talk, uh, the strong consistency half of the talk. So. Uh, so why do we want strong consistency? So strong consistency is important uh, because it provides three, it, it provides a solution for three kind of problems. Um, I was in a meeting yesterday and two of the problems that I'm going to talk about here were mentioned. So the first one is atomicity. Uh, sometimes you want to do a write and ensure that every replica has that value and it gets that value immediately and you know it has that value at that particular time. Uh, this is an important property that databases that have strict consistency or serializability uh, or linearizability have. Um, it's hard to reason about writing a value and not seeing the update uh, immediately and getting an earlier value. Um, CRDTs allow you to guarantee that you'll eventually get the right value and that all of the operations will eventually converge, but it doesn't place a bound on when you're going to see that value, um, which is the second point, which is recency. Um, 
Some applications have a guarantee where you need to write a value and you need to be able to read that value immediately. And you need to be able to read that value in failure conditions uh, up to a particular bounds of number of failures. And finally, partial writes. Because partial writes are problematic. And if you're not familiar with part the partial write phenomenon in React, you have this situation where you say, store a copy of my object on a series of replicas. Two of them say, yes, I did it. And the third one doesn't respond because of a TCP timeout. Well, now you don't know if that value is actually written and you're going to read it next time, um, or if the update failed, because you don't know like how far it got. So uh, partial writes are a problem, and they're difficult to reason about. So um, you imagine this is the example we talked about before. We have three replicas. They're on three different servers. Um, we go to write this B value to the three replicas. We do this, and then we end up with this. So this is a possible scenario where the write, as the user sees it, was determined as a failure because we couldn't write to a quorum of the nodes. We only could write B to 1. However, that value is there. And if you ever did a read and you specified a read quorum of 1 and you happen to get the answer from this guy first, um, or you're dealing with a, mo a more common scenario where you have a, par oh, where you have a network partition and your partition guys who didn't get the right are separated from the guy who did get the right. And imagine there's a bunch of other servers here, other replicas. Um, or you do an evalue, uh, a, re a read value of one. Um, this is a bad situation to be in. Um, and the mechanisms that allow us to repair these things are things like active anti-entropy and read repair, where we can, based on a quorum of values or based on vector clocks or version vectors or active anti-entropy, we can eventually fix these values so everything agrees on the right value. But that's a situation that's, that's difficult to reason about. And programmers don't like thinking about that because uh, you end up writing like, a lot of code to work around these problems. So this thing is getting all confused. I don't know why. Um, OK. So strong consistency. So, so what is strong consistency in terms of React? Um, so it's single key atomic operations. We want atomicity of a single change to a particular object in the data store, and we want that change to be across an entire replica set. So we want all three objects to, all three replicas of that object to get the, uh, the, uh, the correct value immediately. So more succinctly, as it was written in the slide, any get is going to see the most recent put. You're going to write a value. It's going to ensure that all the replicas immediately agree on that value. And then your next read is going to see that observed value immediately. And the way this is supported through the mechanism is that it's going to have this get modified put cycle. So you're going to read a value. You're going to get the vector clock, which is basically a context of the read. You modify the object. And when you write it back, you specify this context. And you ensure that context is we ensure the object hasn't changed since you observed the read. Uh, and we write the value and ensure that all of the replicas agree. Um, in the case where you happen to write the object and you don't specify the context, we'll refuse the row. So if you read x and, the con and it says the context is 1 because it's the first value of x, and then we say write x again, and we give it no context, the system says, well, you didn't read this one potentially. We don't know how to like totally order the writes essentially, um, and it will refuse the right. So you always have to specify this context. And in the CRDT world, you have to specify a context as well when you're doing removes, because we have to reason about which things you've observed being added to allow removes. And that's a very hard concurrency case. Um, but all of our API, all of our libraries automatically take care of it, so you don't have to think about it. Um, so this is, again, this idea of the consensus problem that we all love talking about in computer science. Um, this is the wicked. This is the uh, this is the quote from the FLP paper, uh, which proved that it's very hard to uh, reach agreement when things are failing and messages are asynchronous. And I apologize for the colors. I didn't expect the projector to be this dim. But essentially, consensus comes down to three guarantees that you want to provide in your system, and this is termination, agreement, and validity. So. What are these things? So termination basically means that if I'm going to try to achieve consensus, all of the people that I'm participating in this consensus agreement with have to agree on a value. They have to terminate. Um, so if I have an algorithm that's going to try to achieve consensus, this algorithm has to terminate. Um, this is obviously a property that is very important. Um, when it terminates, it has to terminate with a value. Um, the agreement property says that if all of these things do terminate and return a value, they need to return the same value. Um, it's not a very useful consensus algorithm to have a bunch of computers that agree on a value that, that isn't the same across all of them. 
And finally, validity is that one of the servers participating in this consensus uh, section needs to, agree, needs to propose the value. Um, it's very easy to write a consensus algorithm that always agrees on the same value all the time, and it's never one that's been proposed. Um, there's a funny post that Peter Bayless wrote about this, saying that like you could write a perfectly uh, acceptable distributed consensus algorithm that always agrees on the number 42, but if none of your systems ever have written 42, or never plan on writing 42, it's a pretty useless consensus algorithm. So validity is a very important property that these algorithms need to have. Um, and not to bore you with all the details, but there's a bunch of them. So there's a million variants of Paxos that you can Google about. Uh, there's a ZAB, which underlies Zookeeper, so that's the Zookeeper Atomic Broadcast Protocol. And finally, there's Raft, which is like the more kind of fancy new kid on the block, which tries to simplify Paxos. Um, but it's essentially kind of the same mechanism. It's a simplified API to the same consensus problem. If you're interested, here's a paper that started uh, a lot of it, uh, Part-Time Polymet by Lacey Lamport. Uh, if you Google Paxos, you can see there's a lot of different versions of it uh, that are, are wonderfully available for you to find. Paxos Made Practical, Paxos for Simple Builders, Paxos Made Simple, there's Paxos Made Live, there's Byzantine Paxos, there's a million versions. Um, so you can read those to your heart's delight. Um, Zab, there's a bunch of papers on Zab, the Zookeeper Autonomous Broadcast Protocol. Uh, this is uh, invented at Yahoo when they built Zookeeper. Um, there's three or four papers that talk about how this works. And finally, Raft, the new kid on the block, 2013, Austerhout and Ongaro at Stanford University. And the main purpose of this algorithm was to simplify Paxos so it was easier to implement because it's notoriously difficult to implement in systems. Um, there's a bunch of failed Erlang versions of it as well. We're going to talk about Paxos. We use Paxos. Um, so it's a bunch of coordinated requests across the cluster. Um, there's a bunch of leaders that are elected. Uh, in normal Paxos, this is two round trips per request. So here's a little process diagram. You go to write an object to the system. Uh, we increment a ballot number. We basically tell a bunch of nodes to accept that ballot number and no number greater than that ballot. Uh, we get a bunch of promises from systems to uh, promise to accept that ballot number and no earlier ballot numbers. You have this function that computes over the ballot numbers, basically sends a commit message out to all the parties, and then they accept it. So this is the basis of how Paxos works. So every write into your system in normal Paxos uh, uses this diagram here. So it's two round trips, and it ships the entire state. So when I say entire state, I mean the entire state. Normal Paxos works on the state that the system should agree on. Um, so normal Paxos, if you wanted to implement it with React, is kind of the entire database. So we'll talk about how we get around that. So um, multi-Paxos is a paper that came out a little bit later. And this is an optimization because it says two round trips for every single write um, is expensive. So we don't want to do that. So here's our state diagram. We extend this to have a uh, epoch that gets shipped. So we're also shipping this i value around. So this is an epoch that kind of monotonically increases. And what we do is we say, we do this initial thing for the first write, and then this is done through a leader election. We, we have one prop person who says, I'm going to do this right. And then for every additional write, all we have to do is increase, as long as that node is still the leader, all we have to do is increase that ballot number and do the one round trip process. So um, this allows us to make Paxos a bit more efficient because we're cutting out one round trip request to all the nodes per, um, per write. So, Again, this has this idea that the way the algorithm was written originally was that you want to ship all the state that you want to agree on. Um, and this is kind of like an academic thing where they gloss over the practicalities of doing this like kind of in a real system. Um, so we'll talk about how multi-paxos works in React. Um, so React is key value. Um, all the keys in the system are independent. We provide no multi-key transaction ability. We provide no operations over multiple keys. Every value is basically independent in the system. Um, and the mechanisms that operate on these keys basically are these read, repair, and anti-entropy mechanisms. Read, repair being that when a value gets written and we want to ensure that it's correct on all the nodes, we get that value back and we write it to all the nodes. Um, active anti-entropy being the mechanism where we can examine entire partitions of data and find missing data or incorrect data and true it up. So, what does this give us? So if you have individual keys and none of them are related, that means that we can treat the keys an atomic unit of state. And this is how we're going to operate our multi-paxos implementation. So multi-paxos per key. So, um, so to achieve this, we need groups 
uh, consensus groups. So the parties in our consensus algorithm who are going to agree on a value are going to be the replicas for a particular object in the system. So how do we know uh, what group to make these parties? So we do this based on the replica sets, which are referred to as the preference lists in React. So here, we said that if I write to this pink value, I'm also going to write a copy of the data item to the blue and green value. So what we're saying is this will be a consensus group. This, our preference list will be the consensus group. So if object A has a replica on these three, the consensus group that's responsible for making sure that everybody agrees on object A is going to be those three denotes. Or, or <coughs> um, and this kind of repeats. So you have n partitions, which means that you have n groups of these. Uh, so you essentially have n consensus groups in your cluster. So if you run a 64 partition ring, you'll have 64 preference lists and 64 consensus groups. And these consensus groups are called ensembles. So this is another React library that you can use in your application uh, that's not super React specific. Um, that's called React Ensemble. It's available on GitHub. It is a multi-access implementation in Erlang that is used to build this. It's tested independently and shipped as a dependency of React. So you're free to use this library. So again, just to repeat, ring size of 256, 256 ensembles. So it's this preference preference list idea. So um, how do the ensembles work? So in this group here, uh, let me go back. In this group, we have these three things, these three V nodes. The prime nodes will be running on usually three physical nodes, not guaranteed, depending on your cluster size. Uh, but there are different processes. They're actual Erlang JIT servers. Uh, and what we do is we run a leader election. So this React Ensemble library gives you the ability to do a leader election across a series of processes. So this is the mechanism that allows us to do this leader election. So we elect a leader. And we, as multi-paxos users, we have these monotonically increasing epochs. Uh, and these leaders coordinate all of the get and put operations. So as you write values to the API through things that you want to be strongly consistent, this leader that gets elected per that group uh, is responsible. So the leader is going to read the local object off disk because it knows it will have a copy of it or the request wouldn't have got routed to it. Um, if the epoch is low, older than the oldest, it will go and refresh the object across the replicas, find the most up-to-date committed value, and then update all of the replicas. So in the worst case, where the leader has been re-elected and all of the value is considered invalidated, every request has its two round trips where it needs to basically update the values and then write the new, uh, write the new value. So you see here the process diagram. So if the object epoch is less than the epoch, we get the key, write it back, we compute the latest, update and mark the epoch, the epoch is stored as meta uh, metadata in the object, and then basically write it back. <coughs> uh, we're already running really late, so I, I, I won't go through the whole process diagram in detail, but uh, we can see, we're well, happy to talk more about it. But again, I want to emphasize here that in the worst case scenario, we have to go ver find the most up-to-date object that's been written, committed, and then write it back to all the replicas. So in the worst case, we have those two round trips. In the best case, we can just serve it up locally. So if we look locally and we say, hey, the value I have on disk has the latest epoch, I can return that immediately to the user, and I don't have to do it. So this is interesting because this means that, compared to eventual consistency, if you have a leader that's been elected for a while and you have writes coming into it, this actually will outperform the eventual consistency version because it doesn't need to make the round trip requests. However, you start to pay the penalty when you start having node failures on the other <laughs> You also lose availability because we can't write if the majority is not available, because that is a core principle of Paxos. If you can't write to the majority, you can't accept the write. So, put operations, again, we'll read it, update it, we'll modify the object, we'll commit the modified object. These objects, you have to send that context object so we know that you've read the most up-to-date value and we can kind of build this total order of writes over the partition. And process diagram, very similar. Get the latest value, write it back, update the epoch, associate that epoch with the metadata, put it back. So put operations, in the worst case, it has to update the object, get the latest v-clock, verify that you've read that latest one, and then write it back. In the best case, uh, you have one round trip. You just write it to all the replicas. So again, uh, this idea of a failed quorum, if the leader has to get re-elected, the epoch advances, and now you have this uncertainty across all your data, so you need to do that process again. You read off the disk when the write comes in, update the value, update the epoch and the metadata, and then continue receiving. So, almost done. Cluster membership. So, how does cluster membership work? So, you remember that those nodes, um, you know, if we go back to that, uh, if I go back without my controller failing, 
you remember that in here we have these three nodes, but I said at the very beginning in React that these partitions can be redistributed as nodes come online. So if the if the green's the leader and you know I want to remove green from the cluster, I'm going to force a leader election. Uh, if I happen to remove all three of these and I add three whole new servers, then I have to deal with that scenario too, where potentially the entire quorum of nodes or the entire preference list, the entire consensus group is going away. Um, so if I advance to back where we were, um, so how do we do this? So um, there's a mechanism uh, that exists called multi-paxos joint consensus. And the way this works is that if the preference list in the existing cluster was that nodes one, two, and three with the three replicas, and I'm changing the topology by adding and removing a bunch of nodes, and I'm moving to the seven, eight, and nine are the nodes that are going to be responsible for the replica. Joint consensus says build the two lists of what you think those consensus groups will be. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you create one group where you do consensus against all of them as the transition's happening. And then basically as nodes become unavailable, you remove them. So this is just a mechanism for mitigating dynamic membership while doing um, cluster topology changes. So um, you can read more about uh, multi paxos joint consensus, so there's a little bit better diagram where we say you know, I form this whole group and then as these nodes go offline I start removing them from the consensus group. And then I eventually end up with my own ensemble. So this is how we mitigate those cluster changes while allowing the system to proceed. Okay? Um, and that is basically it. So that's the overview. That's a marathon. 54 minutes. 54 minutes of some good computer science. Um, and I'm happy to take questions uh, on eventual consistency or strong consistency or CRDTs or whatever. Well, what would happen if a node went down in the midst of that process of joining the two consensus groups? So if, well, it depends on if it's a non-leader node or a leader node. So you're going to have that two-phase kind of, that two-phase commit kind of, it's not two-phase commit, but you have like kind of two phases of prepare and commit operations. So if it goes down and doesn't exceed, it's handled in the same way that Paxos handles a node not basically responding. And Paxos being tolerant to whatever, uh, n divided by two plus one or whatever failures, or no, it's, yeah, in the three, in the in the three node version, the multi paxos will be tolerant to two failures, right? In it's the two, React case. Two F plus one. Two F plus one. There you go. Two failures plus one tolerant. The number of nodes that you need to serve. Right. Need two yes. F plus one nodes. Two F plus one to tolerate two F failures. To tolerate F failures. Um, uh, it's, it's a little more subtle than that because the, the Fs aren't necessarily the same type of node. In other words, you need F plus one of one type of node and F of another type of so, node. Some of those just have to be witnesses. They don't need to do the operations, they don't need to the They just need to remember what happened. And that's why it's all witnesses. Question uh, about access and maybe convert to Rust. Uh, from Paxos' point of view, at least how I understand it, you need to have the epoch synchronized. All the operations happen on the epoch pass type of thing, but if their nodes are not really synchronized on the epoch, how you deal with that. And then maybe you could throw some comments on, on RAPS, like if RAPS simplifies the things really efficiently. Uh, so I don't know the answer to the first question because I did not implement that part of it. Uh, I primarily do the CRDT side of things. Um, the strong consistency stuff was implemented by Joe, um, but I'd be happy to get the question answered for you. Um, in terms of the second case, which was uh, Raft, like if, if it implements it, so the, I mean the main point of the Raft paper was to simplify the terminology um, and like the, a lot of it. And it's, 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 it's a different algorithm. It's, it's, it's very similar. And it's very it's similar. It has to have the same things in it because any cons consensus algorithm has to do certain things the same. Sure. That's the maths. Right. Um, but, it, but it's an interesting it's paper because it, it's, it's very similar, but it is a different algorithm. But it's, it's interesting because the evaluation of the paper is not done based on um, it's not based on like performance or correctness of the algorithm. The paper is evaluated. Uh, the paper was evaluated on an undergraduate like quiz at Harvard University, uh, or maybe I, what, maybe it doesn't say Harvard, but it actually was Harvard. Um, and basically, they explained the, the, the algorithm to, 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 to get like 
give a description of them to, to, to the same group of people, and then ask them the questions about them to see which one they understood better. Right. But, um, and this is like, been, which is sort of interesting, but, 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 well, what about, you think, well, pick something simple like, Binary search. You know, one of, I'm, I'm thinking of one of those things with all those little edge conditions that everyone gets wrong, and you just work it out, frankly, to make sure. You right. Um, and and the, paper, the paper has been notoriously system. refused by a ton of conferences. That's unfair. Um, it, 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 or, it, unless they did it for the right reason. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> it, there's an interesting story there. So I, that's all I can really say about it. Um, I don't really know much more. I mean, I know like people who have implemented it. One of the engineers that um, lives pretty close to me in the states because we all live pretty far apart has was working on the Erlang version of it. Um, so I know people who have worked on it, but I I've never implemented it. I read I read the paper briefly. Um, You mentioned before that was there was a property of Erlang that didn't support something. Causal delivery. Oh. Yeah. So um, Erlang has some interesting, so there's interesting, if you read the research on Cloud Haskell, they talk about this a little bit as well. Uh, so Erlang has a property with causal delivery between processes. It says that if process A is sending to process B, process B will receive process A's messages in order. So you have this like causality guarantee between A, but you don't have, but the causality guarantee is not transitive. So if you happen to send, uh, if, if we have three processes and I send to A, and then I send to B, um, I have, and A is going to send to B as well when it receives my message. So I have this transitive message sending here. It makes no guarantees on when that message is delivered. So you actually don't have causal delivery as you'd imagine like, um, like other types of, yeah. So that's a property that makes it very difficult um, to do certain things. And some of the work on, um, I think it was Gen Leader, if you read the, not the, if you read some of the, the early Gen Leader paper, I think the Allfire Hans Svensson paper, yeah. I think specifically talks about that being one of the challenges. Another one is like the failure detectors working a particular way. So, um, but yeah, so that makes it hard to do certain things. Also, like, no ability to do atomic broadcasts. So, like, ISIS-style atomic broadcasts where I could say, uh, send a message to five processes, and they all get it. So, like, in Erlang, Erlang has this module PG that exists that's still in the runtime, or maybe it's not in our 17 anymore, uh, that's been replaced by PG2, but PG originally wanted a, to provide the ability to say, like, bang uh, a list of processes, and they all get it or didn't. Um, so it wanted to have reliable atomic broadcasts. Um, that's a really hard thing to do in Erlang, um, and there's a whole paper about it. Um, so I take it Haskell supports this? No, but when in building Cloud Haskell, they had to deal with some of the weird things. Because Erlang's behavior with sending messages, like, uh, um, there's, what is it? There's some sort of thing that, like, depends on time, too. I forget, I forget the specifics, but if you look at the Cloud Haskell stuff where they try to, they take like the unified semantics of Erlang paper and try implementing it in Haskell so that it has like the actor model with like a lot of the same mechanisms. Uh, you run into problems where there's a bunch of stuff that the behavior is like this behavior for the first 30 seconds, but then it changes to this other behavior once you pass 30 seconds. And there's like a lot of weird things like that that um, the Haskell guys don't like <laughs> because it's hard to model. Um, so. Uh, they diverge a bit from the same semantics, from the, the Erlang semantics, but yeah. So, um, yeah, so some of the CRDT stuff, there's a bunch of papers on uh, commutative replicated data types, and some of the commutative replicated data types rely on causal delivery. Or, um, uh, um, and uh, in this research project, um, we've been doing some work to examine uh, whether, whether like state-based CRDTs, the convergent ones that we merge, rather than the commutative ones where just all the ops get reordered, um, whether like trying to build some causal delivery mechanism, sacrificing availability, so we can explore some of the commutative data structures that is worthwhile or not. So all the time you mentioned C V C C V R D T is that's what you were referring to. The no, ones no. where I merge the state that are the bounded joint semi lattices, those are the convergent ones. Those are state based. Right. Not commutative. Yes. Correct. Um, the state-based ones are where you ship the entire state of the object around, and then you convert. <laughs> the commutative ones are 
you guarantee that all the replicas observe all the updates, and that all of those updates are commutative and idempotent. If you can guarantee that, you converge to the right state. But there are a bunch of gutches when you start modeling more advanced type of data structures where you have to do removals. You have to do removals, you can't really necessarily guarantee that every operation is commuted and idempotent if you need to provide a garbage collection mechanism specifically a garbage collection mechanism that doesn't require consensus. So again, if you think about these two approaches, that's an interesting thing to highlight, right? Is that um, one way to clean up the state, the garbage that these CRDTs generate in the eventual consistency world is to say, well, let's go strong consistency. Let's use Paxos and clean up the state. The problem is that that's not a very re interesting research problem. And it's also, also not very interesting from a scalability point of view as well. Uh, specifically, some of the work that uh, I've been exploring is uh, um, with some other people is using CRDTs as client-side states. You have a rich JavaScript application that can go offline, and then you want that to come back online, and you want all the state to converge. So that's interesting. CRDTs provide a very useful mechanism for that. And you can use it for offline games. We have mobile devices and things like that. Like they're very interesting uh, data structures to use there. And in those cases, you can't clean garbage. You can't get everybody to agree. You can't tell everybody, you know, sign on with your mobile phones at 7 p.m. <laughs> Greenwich Mean Time, because I'm going to run a garbage collection algorithm across all of you. You know, like, uh, it doesn't work. So, um, so yeah, it's, this is why we're trying to find ways to avoid creating garbage. Uh, yeah, did you find it very satisfying implementing all these CRDTs? Because you, you did the CRDT work. Um, I did some of the CRDT work. Uh, mainly Sean Cribbs and Russell Brown did the Erlang implementations. Um, uh, I've, I've been doing other <coughs> research related things like provability and stuff like that. Um, that was too uh, That's my question. Uh, but I do know how, I, I mean, I've worked with that. I might be able to answer the question. Well, it was, it was just, did you find it satisfying, but since it's a subjective. So I, I implemented the data structures. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Watching them do it. Yeah. Um, well, so I, I implemented them. Yeah, I, I've done an implementation implementation of the CRDTs in Clojure, and I uh, Reed Draper did as well. And I also did an implementation of the CRDTs in uh, Comp, the theorem prover. Um, so so yes, I did find it very satisfying. <laughs> uh, the Erlang one, I did some some work. So my, my the main Erlang work that I've been doing is trying to figure out how we can get CRDTs to cross multiple keys or partitions, because uh, when you can when you have the ability to arbitrarily nest these maps super big, um, uh, once those objects get to be like a, a meg, you start like really destroying Erlang distribution. Um, so what I've been specifically working on that I have a couple prototypes of is the ability to split them up so you go to write one map and then it will shard it like kind of auto shards the key. Uh, but this is like purely academic stuff for a paper, not specifically anything that would, would be in the data store. Um, because what, what's interesting to me um, is uh, rather than try to provide like a highly, like a strong consistency multi-transaction over CRDTs where I can say I want to atomically write uh, an update to a series of 20 CRDTs, I'm wondering if there's a more interesting use case where you can say use bottom values of the lattices. Like if you know what the CRDT structure is going to look like, it doesn't matter that maybe you can't observe one of those updates because if you're going to causally make a change based on that uh, and you're guaranteed that the change converges, uh, then maybe you don't need to observe the whole state. Um, in addition to that, what is also interesting related to that on the performance side is that if I have a mega map and I go to write that to the database and then it auto shards out, I'd like the ability to query it and say, I only care about one field, go to that one replica and pull it back, and don't worry about reassembling the data structure as well. Um, so that's kind of some of the stuff that I've like personally been working on um, that I think make it not necessarily as researchy uh, data structure-wise, but like super practical, because um, we all know that like busy disk buffer and like uh, TCP and cast and stuff like that are like real problems that cause systems to collapse. And it's great if you have these data structures that will guarantee that everything converges, but if you can't use it at a large scale, um, then maybe it's less useful. You know, having to stuff all your data in one key is maybe not necessarily the best approach. So, but yeah, the work is the work is super interesting. <laughs> uh, some of the other work that we were doing related to it was exploring if we could automatically generate the CRDTs from a theorem prover. Uh, yes, I was. That was the question. Yeah, that so that. Really good. I was going to ask you about how you validated your implementations against the against the paper, but then there's the other thing, which is that the paper itself has 
people implement data structures from papers, it's often fine. So you get part way through and then think, just a moment, what? What is the point? Yeah, so the original CRDT paper has um, like 20 CRDTs in it, and uh, there's at least four of them that are incorrect in the paper. Um, like the actual like proof and like semantics of how to implement it are just incorrect. Uh, and if you try implementing it, it just won't converge. Well, so that's why I come here, so it saves you time and money. <laughs> it saves you from reading all those papers. Um, no, no, but I, I, I'm now warned that, because I was looking at those. But, uh, in the convergent and commutative paper. Um, so the basic ones are okay. I forget there's a couple of them, some of the more advanced ones towards the graphs end. And stuff doesn't anything. What's that? There's graphs and stuff doesn't Yeah, so the graphs, that's it. The graphs are one where the implementation is not correct, if I remember, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, and whatever the one they talk about in the same section as the maps is also wrong. Uh, the graphs. But yeah, the graphs, I, I know for a fact that the graphs is one of them. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. Uh, we've, had, we've had problems where um, we've implemented quick check suites that are pretty extensive tests for some of the CRDTs and um, run the tests for like 30 hours or something and the models have been wrong and we'll have a customer who finds a bug within 10 minutes of trying it and then we have to go back and like um, fix it. So yeah, it's hard. Um, it's hard when the papers don't have a lot of proofs. Um, uh, in one of the talks I gave about uh, implementing some proofs for the PN counter, uh, I used one of the lines in the paper that was just like, the proofs are left as an exercise to the reader. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, but it's super fun research and I love it and I wouldn't trade it for anything. So, um, But yeah, you have to be very careful. So we're trying to find mechanisms to make it um, so we feel a bit safer about our implementations, but you run into the same problems you have with everything, really. Yep. Anything else? It's been a marathon meetup here tonight. Well, that's, uh, that's all the questions. Thank you, Chris, for doing this.